so in my last lecture we looked at uh, least square approximations method of least square approximations was used to discretize a boundary value problem now unlike uh, orthogonal collocation or finite difference where we took some finite number of points and forced the residual to zero in this case we said that uh, some of the square of something similar to some of the square of errors that is here integral square integral of the square of the residuals now we wanted to minimize that instead of uh, setting instead of setting it equal to 0 in the domain we wanted to minimize the square of the integral over the domain so this was uh, conceptually different from what we have done earlier and we looked at a specific problem so uh, the problem that we looked at was a linear problem so this was so we looked at solving this so this was a boundary value problem with two homogeneous boundary conditions equal to zero and then we wanted to get a solution for this problem now uh, we constructed an approximate solution not exact solution uh, this approximate solution was u cap z was where u1 cap to um cap are some known known functions okay and the idea was to find out idea was to find out unknown coefficients alpha 1 to alpha m such that uh, so we want to if we say theta that is equal to alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha m if we define this vector theta then <coughs> we wanted uh, to find out theta least square that was minimize with respect to theta norm of L u cap z minus f z 2 square so this is nothing but the residual this is nothing but the residual square or integral of the residual this is minimize with respect to theta inner product of L u cap z minus f z so we wanted to find out least square estimate such that well we had chosen the basis functions in this particular case such that the boundary conditions are met ok so we had a special case uh, and then with this we derived the normal equation we derived something that looked like a normal equation so basically uh, idea was to minimize this with respect to theta so here between any f and g uh, or say h and g inner product is defined as 0 to 1 f tau okay so this gave us this gave us the equation that was needed to solve this particular problem okay now uh, to minimize this or to get the solution if we take this as phi if we take this objective function to be phi then we use the condition do phi by do theta is equal to do phi by do theta is equal to 0 uh, this particular condition can be used and you can obtain alpha 1 to alpha m numerically but in a special case where l is the linear operator okay we could get 
the so called normal equation we could get the solution analytically okay if it is if it is not a linear operator you will not be able to solve alpha 1 to alpha m analytically you will have to use some numerical optimization to get the solution and then uh, well well there will be a, well whether there will be a unique minimum and all that is not guaranteed but in this case when l is a linear differential equation we could actually find a uh, solution to this problem that is we could find theta least square analytically using a uh, equation that looked almost like normal equation so this this was the way we went about doing this well there is a small modification suppose uh, here what do you do if you want to take a general case and uh, see what if what if this is alpha what if what if what if this is uh, some a and this is some b they are not equal to 0 okay suppose this is equal to a and this is equal to b and so uh, well in that case what we do is we do a simple linear transformation and then uh, try to map it to 0 to 1 in such case we define instead of uz I will call a new function say vz which is I will define a transformation I will define a new variable vz which is uz plus b minus a times z plus a uh, what will be vz you know in terms of in terms of this new variable in terms of this new variable I will get it is very easy to see that I will get l just check this we will get uh, z1 and z0 so we can do a little bit of a transformation can do a transformation here uh, at 0 at uz at, at z equal to 0 ok you will have this is 0 ok uh, sorry this is a this is a uh, this will be ok so now uz equal to vz plus ok so now it will fall out now it will work out so uh, uz is equal to vz plus b minus a times z and uh, plus a so we take let us take a specific operator that we looked at yesterday so instead of L let us look at the specific problem that is d2 u by dz square minus uz is equal to 1 this was the problem that we looked at ok if you use this transformation then the transform problem will be d2 v by dz square minus v is equal to 1 plus b minus a z plus a so this gets transformed to this and you can check here boundary conditions get boundary conditions in terms of u will become in terms of v will become v0 is equal to 0 v1 is equal to 0 just just check here so at uh, 0 at 0 we have at 0 we have this nicely following and at 1 well will it be vz is equal to at c equal to 1 so if I put 0 here if I put 0 if I if I put b here so b equal to yeah 0 0 will cancel and b b will cancel and you will get 0 v 0 so the problem gets transformed like this so this is one way of dealing with the problem the other way of dealing with the problem is modifying the definition of inner product so now we have to work with uh, instead of working with the, the the space of twice differentiable functions we have to work with uh, product spaces and define a inner product slightly differently so this is one way of dealing with non-homogeneous boundary conditions you could do a transformation and then solve this problem 
so the when you take uh, derivative of this second derivative of this this will disappear right i am taking second derivative of this second derivative of this will disappear this part will disappear what remains is still d2v by dz square and then when you substitute this for for u here when you substitute this okay it will be minus of this which on this side will become plus so the problem gets transformed to this problem and the other solution will still work but there is more general way of this is this looks like a fix by which you know we have done some transformation and we got this uh, a better way is to change the definition of the inner product itself so what we can do now is that this equation which we are looking at this equation that we are looking at l is a map from l is a map from twice differentiable continuous functions to set of continuous functions over 0 to 1 cross r cross r this we have seen so this is the product space and now we have to define the inner product in slightly different way so if i define the inner product see this i have to define the inner product on this space and if i define a proper inner product on the uh, uh, inner product on this space then i can solve the problem in slightly different way so what i do now is i have to define a inner product of i want to define a inner product of uh, a function say uh, h ht then a scalar c1 and a scalar c2 with inner product of with gt c3 i am defining in a product on this product space i am defining in a product on this product space now this in a product will be modification of this in a product will be modification of this plus w some positive weight which is w1 times c1 c3 plus w2 times c2 c4 the inner product now the inner product now is defined as integral of ftgt inner product is defined as in a this is ftgt plus w1 times c1 into c3 w2 times w1 and w2 are positive weights okay so w1 and w2 are positive weights okay so with this with this what i can do is uh, earlier uh, how did we how did we derive how do we arrive at the uh, optimality criteria we defined the residual square we defined the residual square and then we took derivative with respect to theta you remember that we took derivative with respect to theta theta was nothing but alpha was alpha to the multiplying coefficients to the basis functions okay so now with this with this modified definition of the inner product what what happens is the residual square that is two norm of residual this is equal to residual okay actually residual will be will have to be defined uh, so i should say i should say residual and okay now i am taking three residuals one residual is over the domain okay now that is that will be taken care by integral over 0 to 1 and the two residuals at the two ends two boundary points okay i am defining two residuals and now i am going to take square of this 
So my objective function which I minimize is going to be this plus this plus this. So the way it will change is this integral it will be it will be so this will be equal to 0 to 1 ok. See now just look at this. This was already there earlier. We are minimizing this earlier right. In addition now I have two terms. I am minimizing difference between u0 and a b0 and u1 and b ok. Now when I when I actually minimize this so how do I get how do I get theta what is my approximate solution my approximate solution is my approximate solution is u cap z is alpha 1 ok and my theta is this vector alpha 1 to alpha m ok and here here this residual square ok this residual square I am going to call as phi and then how do I get the conditions to how do I get my conditions to solve the problem it is dou phi by dou theta is equal to 0 but now phi is going to be this so there are two additional terms ok now the trouble with this approach is that the boundary conditions will not be exactly met the boundary conditions will be met in the least square sense this equality may not be there you know well you can make it you can make it uh, you know go closer and closer by increasing these weights you put more weight to this the optimizer will try to squeeze in and make sure that u cap 0 and u cap 1 are closer to each other ok now by this approach I do not have to uh, choose uh, the functions which are giving this equal to this and this equal to this ok let us say I am choosing shifted Legendre polynomials the two boundary points are not you know a and b but by this approach I can choose the coefficient such that sum of the square of you know uh, difference between the solution and the exact boundary condition is minimized and together with you know the differential equation is obeyed in the least square sense not exactly equal to when I minimize this when I minimize this this term will not be exactly equal to 0 because I am minimizing I am finding a least square solution ok uh, true solution for this problem will be some uh, in an infinite dimensional space I am taking a finite dimensional approximation ok <coughs> so that is how uh, I get get a solution here that is that is one way to solve this problem now there is one more variant of this method ok now, this is the method of least squares and uh, you will get of course uh, that equation by which you can get analytical solution of theta if l is a if l is a linear operator then you will get a closed form solution for theta and uh, once you get that closed form solution alpha 1 to alpha m will if you put those values back you will get this least square solution of ok so uh, by this approach now I could choose a polynomial expansion nothing stops me I can choose a polynomial expansion here so these functions could be you know 1 t t 1 z z square z cube up to z to the power m and then I can minimize this objective function with respect to alpha 1 to alpha m and get my uh, solution ok. So earlier particularly for Taylor series approximation and for uh, approximations using uh, orthogonal collocations we were only considering you know uh, interpolation solutions we are mainly considering the polynomial approximations here too you if you want to work with polynomials in principle you can work with polynomials not a, not an issue ok so that that will not be a limiting uh, factor so uh, but we are choose we might we can as well choose some convenient basis like sin cos or shifted general polynomials and work with that ok. So this this uh, almost now brings us close to 
uh, end of this discretization there is one more point to be discussed now this is this is a method called gelarkins method and i'm going to just briefly touch upon this method in gelarkins method we don't attempt to minimize we don't attempt to minimize this okay in in least squares method we we try to minimize the sum of the square of errors okay gelarkins method is just uh an extension of uh, just an extension of the idea of projection okay just an extension of idea of projections now uh, i am not going to derive it in any way i am just going to propose this method and what is the basis for this method should be now clear to you when i write the equations the basis is idea of projections okay uh so what i'm going to do in gelarkins method what is different here is that we don't put this objective function we don't put this objective function or we don't put any of the uh minimization problem and so on but we use one fact see what we know in projections that the error should be orthogonal to the subspace spanned by the basis okay whatever is the subspace which you are given so uh, here if i take a set if i take a subspace s which is defined by span of u1 cap u2 cap um cap okay then i could derive i could derive an approach let us say i have i have defined my uh, inner product like this okay i will define my inner product like this i am not interested in minimizing the square of the residuals but what i am interested in doing is just using the fact that uh, when you do projections the error is orthogonal to the subspace okay so what i am going to do there is i am going to say that u1 z u1 z is equal to r z uh this is equal to 0 i want the error i want the error to be orthogonal to the subspace spanned by okay this u1 to um so i am just taking this basis basis vectors and i am forcing the condition that this to be equal to 0 okay this i have to use together with my uh two boundary conditions to solve the problem now you may not be able to force it equal to 0 for all the points in some cases because in some situations where you have boundary conditions you may want to uh force it force this equal to 0 only at m minus 1 vectors and then two points come from the boundary conditions because uh two conditions will arrive at the boundary condition i'll look at a specific problem to just give you an insight let's go back to the tram problem now this particular condition this particular approach of solving will reduce to the square problem when the operator is linear okay when the operator is linear the square method and gelarkins method will become identical but when the operator is not linear okay so uh, you will get a solution which is which is different so this is this can be applied gelarkin method can be applied to any other uh, operator which is not necessarily a linear operator it could be a non linear differential equation and you are trying to solve it and uh, basically what we do is we don't get into uh, minimizing the residual we, we just say that the error between the solution and the subspace okay that error is orthogonal to the subspace spanned by the basis functions of the solution that is the simple idea which is used so this is uh let's go back to the tram problem and now that you have solved it using orthogonal collocation and finite difference you'll be able to appreciate this third method how do you choose this basis functions you know uh how do you choose them to be orthogonal there are different ways of choosing uh, basis functions here we actually get into gelarkin method is belongs to the class of finite element methods and you will 
because it involves this particular method would involve integral over the entire domain. Uh, this methods tend to give very uh, accurate solutions and uh, I am not going to get into the details of how do you choose these basis functions. Now there are some uh, continuous basis functions which are like uh, you know, cap function and so on. So if you want to know more about this well it is there in the notes you can check this. Also uh, book by Gilbert Strang okay uh, his latest book on applied linear algebra and his first book on linear algebra with applications both of them give you very very good introduction uh, I think the latest book on computational science and engineering he has the latest book on computational science and engineering and the other one is on linear algebra the second one gives very detailed introduction to this topic but this uh, becomes little more involved uh, I just want to mention this more for the sake of completeness. So if we go back to our TRAM problem, so this is 1 by picklet number into D2C by DZ square so this is the problem with two boundary conditions DC by DZ is equal to picklet number into C minus 1 at, at 0 and dc by dz is equal to 0 at z is equal to 1 you already know about this problem and uh, what I am going to do here now is my solution my solution here is going to be this is going to be my approximate solution okay and to get the equations what I do here is to get the equations so this integral or this inner product this inner product is equated to right hand side is 0 anyway right hand side is 0 for r is equal to 2 m minus 1 so we we equate this we equate this to 0 for i is equal to 2 minus 1 now this this is you know even if you take some nice functions just remember that i have to take second derivative of that first derivative of that and then square of this function and then calculate all the integrals okay it's a uh, it is a fairly involved job in terms of computing the coefficients. Finally, what you are going to get is a m minus 1 nonlinear equations in m minus 1 unknowns. Sorry, m, uh, uh, m minus 1 unknown, uh, equations in m unknowns. One minute. We will get m minus 2 equations because we are starting with 2 and going to m minus 1. Okay. So, putting this will give you m minus 2 equations in m unknowns okay m unknowns are uh, alpha 1 to alpha m okay the rest two equations will come from boundary conditions so these two equations these two equations together with m minus 2 equations will give you m equations in m unknowns what are the m unknowns alpha 1 to alpha m so these are nonlinear equations and the terms that appear in the coefficients of these nonlinear equations will be all integrals which you have to integrate which you have to find out okay so numerically this particular scheme is very very involved but the dividends are very high okay you get good solutions that is why you know the finite element methods FEM methods are so where is this finite business comes when you construct this basis functions you divide the domain into a into a into a finite number of elements and on each one of them you define some nice uh, functions which are orthonormal and those functions are used to uh, see for example one could use uh, one of the one of these functions one of the popular functions are 
I mean, you might wonder why, where is the discretization, where is the finite element business coming here, okay. So, you define functions over this domain which look like this and so on. You divide it into finite domains. So, this is divided into say three, three or four domains. So, this is, this is one, this is second, this is third. So, you have this cap functions, okay, which are continuous at these points. They are linear in this region. So, you have to divide the integral from integral over, over the domain 0 to 1. You have to divide between this point to this point, this point to this point and this point to this point. You have to divide the integral into three parts and then evaluate each integral, okay. And then likewise, you have to do it for every one of them, okay. These are not differentiable. So, there are ways to construct differentiable functions. I am just giving you a, a just the idea. So, you can construct differentiable functions, you can construct smooth functions which are okay and then those smooth basis functions can be then uh, uh, so you can construct smooth functions not an issue. So, just to give you an idea you can construct a basis which looks like this over finite domain. So, this function basis over only some domain it will be non you know it will have non zero value it will have zero value elsewhere okay that is why it makes it into finite uh, so, because, because the function value is 0 from here to here, you do not have to evaluate the integral, okay. You just have to evaluate between this point and this point. And because of this, this uh, special class of functions that you consider, what happens is that uh, finally the equations which you get uh, have some kind of a sparse structure, okay. And uh, you can exploit that to solve some big problems. So, I am going to stop this Galarkin's method only here. I just wanted to connect everything into place, you know. I am not getting more into Galarkin's method because it, if I have to now expand on the finite element methods, it will be fairly complex. It will not be as easy as orthogonal collocations and uh, finite difference. Finite difference and orthogonal collocations are very, uh, finite difference is the easiest to understand. Well, I would in terms of understanding the complexity, I would put orthogonal collocations next. It's not, it's not that difficult to understand. It's basically interpolation, and then you know you are just transforming the problem into a set of nonlinear algebraic equations. Here too, you will finally get nonlinear algebraic equations. The coefficients will be integrals, and those integrals will be fairly complex to evaluate. They are quite cumbersome. So it's not that if you have to write a program for this, so that's why you get now commercial programs which can actually do all these integrals and solve them. Okay, so uh, all those together will give you a set of equations which which have to be solved simultaneously to arrive at the solution. You can do that. Yeah, m, that m is notional. See, you can have uh, the the problem is that here these equations can be forced only at the internal segments, not at the boundary points. At the boundary points, you will need to enforce the boundary conditions. Okay. So, uh, unless uh, the the you, you use some trick what we did earlier, we had modified the inner product definition, right? That trick could be used. You know, you could modify the inner product definition to include the two endpoints. Then, you know, the, then the boundary conditions are satisfied in the least square sense. Not exactly. Okay, so you could play all those tricks uh, of modifying the inner product definition and then including. Uh, the two uh, endpoints, and then all that is possible. Okay, so now uh, see because this why that is possible because each of this function. See if you look at this function here, this function is defined over the entire domain. Okay, so this function is defined over the entire domain. So you in a product can be modified to include this point, this point, and integral over this point. Okay, so then this this uh, inner product here will get modified with two additional terms for the endpoints. Okay, and then you can have you don't have to have you force this. You can just force m one to m, and be done with it. That is also possible. Okay, but in that case, see if you do this, these two will be exactly satisfied. If you do it the other way, you know where you include 
those two uh, as sum of the squares in the in a powder definition then they will be satisfied in the least square cells not exactly exactly satisfied okay so we have looked at now let me sum it up what we have looked at is uh, you know method of discretizing problems from so what happens here even in this case you start with a problem which is in the infinite dimensions you construct an appro approximation which is finite dimensional and then finally what you are going to get here after you do all these integrals and everything what are you going to get here you are going to get m m equations in m unknowns in this case there will be nonlinear equations okay if l was a linear operator if this square wasn't there you will get linear equations and you can solve them very easily okay but we have this square here so because of that you will get you know all kinds of square terms alpha 1 alpha 2 and you will have to do complex integrals of you know uh, u1 with u1 square u2 u2 square and all kinds of all kinds of terms will appear in the integrals now because because uh, you you get uh, because of that you will get non linear equations but what is happening if you realize is that a problem which was originally in the infinite dimensional space is transformed into a finite dimensional algebraic equation solving problem okay so i am transforming a problem which was originally solving boundary value problem a uh, differential equation is is getting transformed into a uh, problem of solving m equations in m unknowns okay so the transform problem looks completely different from the original problem solving nonlinear algebraic equations is completely different problem from the original problem okay so there are some issues like errors in discretization so when you actually solve a problem okay see there are variety of errors that creep in see we said that we wanted to solve y inverse problem y is equal to t of x where x x belongs to some space x and y belongs to some space capital y we wanted to solve this problem okay but we are not able to solve the original problem in most of the cases in you know you might wonder well i am doing a course on uh, solving partial differential equations and linear partial differential equations okay uh, i can solve them analytically you know i can do all these series expansions why do i need all this just go back and check when you can solve those problems analytically you can solve those problems analytically when the boundary conditions are very nice geometry is simple okay when the geometry is simple if i ask you to solve laplace equation to be formula formulated for this room and if you do not approximate walls to be smooth walls suppose i want to say well there is a you know small notch here and then it comes out and then okay my boundary is no longer my boundary is no longer you know straight wall then suppose i have a problem see if i if i take the reality that well the uh, you know the conductive the the convective heat transfer from this wall is different at different places okay in some region there is wall okay so the the there will not be uh, heat transfer there will be you know there will not be uh, convective heat transfer there will be some something like you know insulation okay but in between there are windows so if i take all these realities into account my boundary conditions even for the simple laplace form the linear operator will be very complex and i will not be able to get those closed form solutions those closed form solutions work they are very nice they gives us they give us insight okay and when you can approximate geometry to be spherical cylindrical okay or perfect you know square or some uh, parallelogram you can actually solve those problems very <laughs> but those you should look at them as some kind of limiting conditions approximating this room okay uh, with smooth walls and you know uh, only one kind of boundary condition across this wall and all all these walls are exactly constant temperature is a, is a simplification and probably that was relevant you know 40 50 years back when computing was difficult now you can compute you can say that well there is a small notch here and i want to compute for this what happens here okay so 
So when even for a linear problem, when the analytical solution can be found for nice boundary conditions, they may not be computable when the boundary conditions become weird. So even for even for linear partial differential equations, you would need to solve them numerically. The class of problems which can be solved analytically is very small. Most of the problems, you know, in real life have to be solved using numerical methods. So you better understand these numerical methods. So what we are doing here is we are actually transforming this as I said into y n is equal to t tilde x n where x n typically belongs to some finite dimensional space some finite dimensional space and uh, y n belongs to some some finite dimensional space well do not confuse this x this y and this x this y Okay, probably maybe I should use some other notation x and some different kind of y okay so this is some this is some finite dimensional space this is some finite dimensional space so you have taken the problem and then transformed it okay for example finite difference method you are not able to force SDL to equal to 0 at all the points you know you have to take finite grid points to save it say that is equal to 0. So actually this problem this problem is an approximation of the original problem this is an imposter this is not a true problem this is just you know this 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 looks like this but not this is not equal to this okay and further see how many how many errors we commit first of all we are not able to solve the original problem we transform it into something which is computable then you know you say that this is this is belongs to some rn let's say this is the transform problem is in n dimensions and this is in some m dimensions uh, so let's say this is rn to rn okay n equations in n unknowns you have, you have uh, got and this t cap is a different operator altogether this is all a differential operator these are algebraic equations you know something else now when you go to computer Okay, you cannot solve using real numbers. You have finite precision. You do everything using rational numbers. Okay, and then see nonlinear different nonlinear algebraic equations. You cannot solve them exactly. You use Newton Epsilon. So you further approximate this. See, you started from here. You approximated this. From here, you again approximate because you know Newton Epsilon is required. Newton Epsilon requires Taylor's approximation again. Okay, so there are series of approximations. Just imagine. So what do you get finally? Okay, so there is an approximation for. Okay, you end up with you you know you end up with y n tilde x n tilde. Suppose suppose the true solution of this this problem transform problem was actually y star x star or let us say y n star x n star and the true solution here is y star x star. So the true true solution is y star x star. Then you have a transform problem which has a true solution. Suppose you forget where it came from. Okay, that is a true solution. So that will be y n star x n star. Okay, but nonlinear algebraic equations suppose you get you are not able to solve them again. Okay, so you get an approximation to this so that is y n tilde x n tilde okay what would be of interest to you is what is the difference between y star minus y n tilde well first of all can i compute this sometimes in many cases you just cannot actually define this because you know your true solution will be a continuous function and this finite element method finite difference method you got some finite points so what is the error between this and this this is defined only at finite points this is defined everywhere in the in the domain so you know this this animal is difficult to even think about okay so this you start with something you want to solve something you actually transform it that also you cannot solve then you retransform it okay what you will see that when you go from here to here now these lectures I will start post mid sem when I go from here to here again I have to use approximations 
again when I when I solve this problem, I am going to again go back to Taylor series. I am going to go back to Weierstrass theorem, polynomial approximations, interpolations, same idea. Okay, so Taylor series and uh, you know uh, polynomial interpolation gave me this, but again I am not able to solve this. So again Taylor series, again you know uh, the in interpolation kind of approximations, and then solve that problem. Okay, so finally what we get. And what we intend to do is completely different. Hopefully, you know, they are close. And that is where your insight as an engineer comes into picture. Are these numbers which computer is throwing, does it make sense? Is this close to this? Well, in many situations, many situations, you do not know what is true, true Y or you do not know what is true X. But as an engineer, you have gut feeling that what is true, what, is, what should true X look like? Okay, you know that you know if there is a PFR, the concentration of the reacting species will reduce as Z. You know this. Okay, so if that is not happening here, okay, you know that there is something wrong. Computer is giving me garbage. Okay, so that is where that is where, in spite of in spite of all these uh, you know advanced techniques, in spite of availability of you know very very powerful computing tools. Uh, we are still in business because your intuition as chemical engineers is required. Otherwise, you know, computer would do everything. You wouldn't, and you and me will not be required. Okay, but fortunately, that is not the case. Okay, we still get our jobs because you have to make a comment whether this, uh, though you cannot define this difference, whether this y and tilde which you get finally, does it make sense? Okay, is it a good solution? So that's where we come into picture. Now to do all this business. You have to solve many things approximately. To solve approximately, you have to give an initial guess. How do you give an initial guess? Only if you are a good physicist, engineer, chemist, chemical engineer, you can generate a good reasonable initial guess and then you can solve the problem. Otherwise, you will not be able to solve the problems. Okay. So this, this brings us to end of problem discretization. So what we have seen till now is that first of all, we have seen that a problem can be represented most of the problems in chemical engineering or engineering literature can be represented by this generic form where y, they are inverse problems. We are given y and t, we want to find out x. Okay, We cannot solve them in most of the cases, so we transform them to this problem. So we have come up to this point. Okay, Now post mid-sem, I will begin how to go from here to here and how to compute the solution. Okay, So now we will get into solving tools like solving linear algebraic equations, solving sparse matrix equations, solving them you know, you know, using some uh, iterative methods, all kinds of things. Non-linear algebraic equations, we have looked at one method, uh, newton raphson there are many tweaks, enhancements, how to do those enhancements. And then the second thing which we have to look at is ODE initial value problems because many problems get transformed to ODE initial value problems. So how do you integrate differential equations? subject to initial conditions. All those Runge kutta methods, predictor corrector methods, Euler integration, everything will come in that. So post mid we will look at tools, till now we have looked at problem transformations. Okay.